Hello. How's it going? It's going really well. <laughs> what is your name? My name is Sean Swarner. Sean. And tell me about yourself, Sean. Well, I, I first need to apologize uh, for my scruffy look. Um, I haven't had a haircut in about two months because I just got back from a month stint in uh, Tanzania, Africa. Oh, my goodness. Okay. My father was born. No, he was born in Greece, but he spent 15 years of his life in Tanzania. Did he really? Where? Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, in um, uh, Tanganyika. Tanganyika. Uh, yeah, yeah. Lake near Lake Tanganyika. I can't remember exactly where. Well, because there's there's a bunch of towns there. There's, there's we always fly into Moshi. We fly into Kilimanjaro International Airport, and then we drive to Moshi. There's, the big cities there are um, obviously Dar es Salaam. Then you have Zanzibar on the coast. Then you have um, uh, Moshi and Arusha. And then yes, off, that off was the it. Side. He was in Arusha. Nice. He grew up in Arusha. Wow. So, do you speak any Swahili? Jumbo. My Jam, Jambo Buana, Habarigani. Exactly. So tell me, what were you, I mean, tell me about yourself, because I don't know who you are, but we're going to find out who you are. Well, see, here's here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we play 20 questions. All right, let's do it. <laughs> so what, how does that work? I ask you a question, you ask me a question, tell me. Because well, well, I know you know nothing about me. I know, I know that. Bit. Yeah, you know absolutely nothing about me, except that I just got back from Africa. Yes, and I thought it'd be fun to have you just ask me some questions instead of me telling you. About okay. Me. Okay. What inspires you the most out of anything in the entire world? Great question. I would say giving hope to cancer patients and letting other people in the world know that anything's possible. Mm, okay. Tell me a story about a time when you did that. I'd, I'd, I'd try to do it every day. Just going, going back to Africa, that was actually my 21st trip up Kilimanjaro. Wow. So you went all the way up Kilimanjaro. I, I do it every year as a fundraiser for a cancer charity. Okay. All right. Um, and how did you become someone who climbs Mount Kilimanjaro 21 times? The first time I did it was part of what's called the seven summits. Okay. Yeah. I've heard about that. Which is the highest mountain on every continent. Okay. And I've gone back every year because the cancer climber association actually pays for a survivor's trip to go up every year and anyone can go, which I, I encourage you, you should, you should go with this in, in February or June next year. So we had two people, two survivors go this year that we actually funded their entire trips were covered and they raised enough to take three survivors next year. So I'm hoping with those three survivors, they can raise funds for to take four or five survivors in 2023. But like I said, anyone can go. So the, the main idea and the concept behind the trip is really to show people that anything's possible and, and help them see life from a different perspective. Okay. So sometimes people say to me, they're like, Leon, what do you do? Right. And I tell them, well, I'm an author. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm a traveler. But if you were to ask, let's say, a fireman, so what do you do? It's simple. I'm a fireman. So my question to you, because I, I want to know, is what do you do? Who are you? See, that, that I would answer the question very similarly to you, because I travel quite a bit. And... <clears throat> Whenever anyone asks me that question, I, I come back with a very, very similar answer. I tell them that I am a, a professional keynote speaker, a climber, an adventurer, and I also run a nonprofit for teens with cancer. Okay. All right. Um, and, and what kind of stuff do you speak about? See, that's going to give everything away. I, I talk about surviving two terminal cancers and climbing the seven summits and reaching the North and South Poles and also completing the Explorer's Grand Slam, which is what I just mentioned, um, in combination with finishing the Hawaii Ironman. Wow. So, so you said you, you survived two terminal cancers. Two, exactly. Yeah. When I was 13, uh, was the first one Hodgkin's lymphoma. Second one was 
uh, at 16, I was given 14 days to live with Askin sarcoma. And I only, I only have one functioning lung because of that. I mean, that must have clearly shaped your whole life, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look, think, think back at, at what you were doing when you were, let's say, 13 to 6, 17 years old. What were you doing in your life? Playing soccer. Worried, worried about being popular, trying to get the girls, trying to um, be in the popular, the, 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 uh, with, with the clicks that, uh, you know, got the most attention, trying not to embarrass yourself. I was 60 pounds overweight, not worried about that stuff one bit. It definitely put things in perspective. And what, what did it teach you, having two moments where you thought that was it? Well, and at the- such a young age? Well, I, th- I think those those two moments really shaped my entire world. You know, I mean, I, at, at 13, I remember being 60 or 70 pounds overweight, bald from head to toe, on my hands and knees, in the shower, weeping, just sobbing, and pulling chunks of hair out of the drain so the water could go down. And I think that was the, the, the first big one. And even earlier that morning, I remember waking up and uh, going into the shower because I remember seeing a ton of hair on my pillow. And I didn't find this out until later. My mom told me, wow, just recently, that every time I went into the shower, she would go in there and replace the pillow cover so I wouldn't see the hair falling out of my head. And I think that's that's an incredible mom. But it, it shaped my life, understanding that those things aren't important. I mean, I've, I've never seen a U-Haul in a funeral procession. And I don't I think you're not going to take that stuff with you. So I, I want people to understand and know what I know about life without having to go through what I went through. Mm. And what would you tell people who've never had something like that happen to them, who maybe take things for granted? What would you want to teach them without having to go through what you went through and what many people go through? I think I would, I would want to teach them not necessarily teach them. I would want them to learn how to utilize their personal core values to get the most out of life or happiness. Because I think people, people are chasing things that don't matter to them. And they're going after certain things that, that they think someone else wants for them, or this is what they want for, for someone else. You need to follow and, and chase after what you value most. And I, I definitely learned that as a, you know, going through the two cancers I, I had. You know, Hodgkin's and, and asking sarcoma. In fact, in college, I didn't, I, I was the only guy who wasn't worried about asking any girl out on campus. I mean, she said, no, who cares? You know, what a big deal. So to live bravely, to live freely, to live with courage, to be spontaneous. I would say to live an unstoppable life. A, f- a fearless life. Let me take that back. Live a fearless life because so many people are worried about things that probably will never happen. You know, how many times have you been sitting there worrying about something and, and all of a sudden uh, after the event happened, you look back and think to yourself, why was I so worried about that? Mm. What inspired you to climb count map? Kilimanjaro 21 times. And sorry if these questions are simplistic, but I'm still trying to get to know you. So w- what inspired that? I mean, you went from having two near terminal illnesses, right? And from our brief conversation, I know that you travel and climb Mount Kilimanjaro 21 times. So how did you go from those two illnesses to climbing Mount Kilimanjaro 21 times? Well, it started with Mount Everest. You climbed Mount Everest. <laughs> Mount Everest. <laughs> what, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> because it didn't come up yet. That, wow. wasn't your, that wasn't one of your 20 questions. That's true. So you climbed Mount Everest. Yeah. I, I actually am the first cancer to the survivor to the top. I'm the first cancer survivor to climb Mount Everest. Wow. Among other things. And I, and I did it with one functioning lung. Uh, and tell me, what was the feeling when you were at the bottom of Mount Everest looking up? And what was the feeling when you were at the top of Mount Everest looking down? 
when I was at the bottom, when I first got there looking up, I thought to myself, holy shit, this is a big mountain. <laughs> but then when I, when I started getting used to the altitude, the feeling at the bottom was very similar to the feeling at the top. Because I, 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 I'm a huge believer in the mind-body connection. So before I even made it to the summit, I was already there here. Mm. I had seen myself on the summit every single night, eight months beforehand. You know, I, I smelled the ozone. I, I heard the snow like styrofoam crunching under my feet. You know, I, I felt, I heard the, the wind whipping by my ears. I felt the, the, the sun, the radiation burning my face. In fact, I came home with, with radiation burns. So that the feelings were, were very, very similar. Um, one thing I, I did that always kept me pushing through the altitude because we had, I mean, you have to cross these aluminum ladders that span crevasses and, and you're going over chunks of ice, the size of skyscrapers. And I was trying to, to prove to people what they once thought was physiologically impossible. They thought it was impossible to climb Everest with one lung. So going up there, I felt like I was adding fuel to the fire by listening to the naysayers. Like, oh, you can't do that. I'm like, you know, watch me. I'm, I'm going to make it happen. But the whole time I was climbing, I actually had a flag that had names of people touched by cancer folded up in my chest pocket close to my heart as a reminder of why I was doing what I was doing. What would you say to people that have their own Mount Everests to climb that are not the literal Mount Everest? How would you inspire them to start climbing and to believe that when things aren't going well, they can keep on climbing and get to that peak place, which you got to actually literally? Well, and that's a great question because I I think not everyone's going to climb Everest, obviously. Yeah. But everyone has an Everest to climb. Yes, you know, as as you were saying. So anyone who's who's starting off, you're going to experience crevasses. You're going to experience uh, potential avalanches. You know, hazards, altitude sickness, and and looking at the mountain. Also, there are, there are numerous routes to get to the top. Pick one that works for you. Pick one that that say say you say you're a great climber. And you want to take the technical route up any peak. It doesn't matter which peak. You know, if, if you're not that experienced, go up the, the more traveled route. But find one that suits your personal core values and, and really tap into why you're doing it. Because the group I've taken up Kilimanjaro, my success rate is double that of the mountain's average. The mountain's average is 48%. My groups are at 99%. And I think it's because we help them understand that you don't conquer the mountain, you conquer yourself. And it's not really an expedition, it's, it's an inspiration. You know, you go inside. And I think what I would tell anybody who's starting off on their personal, personal climb is sometimes you have to believe it before you see it. And once you do that and you tap into your personal core values, anything, any obstacle that, get, that could potentially get in your way is never going to be enough to stop you. Because in, the, in your mind's eye, it's worth every bit of pain and agony. And tell us, what was it like when you put your foot on the summit, when you knew that you had literally climbed Mount Everest? Well, in, in all honesty, I had to go to the bathroom, so I wrote my name in the snow <laughs> when I first got up there. <laughs> but I, the, the feeling was something I don't think I could ever – recreate. Um, it was like you, you have everything that you've ever imagined, every emotion you've ever had in your life, and you explode it in a millisecond. Because I, there, there was sadness, there was happiness, the sadness, because I was thinking of all the people on the flag who passed away from cancer. Why was I alive? You know, the survivor's guilt, boom, kicks in. Um, I, I, was, I was extremely happy that I made it to the top, becoming the first cancer survivor to make it to the top of the world. Um, I was extremely anxious because when you get to the top, you're only halfway. So it was like, it was like everything you can possibly imagine exploding all at once. And then shoo, kind of coming right back again, because reality sits in after you start looking around thinking, well, shoot, I have to go back down. <laughs> mm. What was it like getting down? Because if I'm not mistaken, they say that the toughest part is getting down. Is that correct? The more, the most dangerous parts getting down. Yes. Yes. Because so many people focus 
Exactly. They focus on getting to the top. They don't think about getting down. So mentally, you're exhausted. Physically, you're exhausted. You, you, you become more lackadaisical coming down, which could cause some severe, uh, severe problems. Because if you say you're going up a, an angle like this, if you're going up the mountain and you trip going up, you fall into the mountain. If you trip coming down, you tumble. So I really had to focus on keeping that emotion, that proud moment that I had of, of being up there and, and taking all those other people who've been touched by cancer to the top of the world with me and keeping my wherewithal literally on every step going back down. Did you have any moments where you nearly didn't make it down or up? And how did you get over those? Up, yes. Up. Actually, it was interesting because we were at Camp 3, which is there are four camps on the south side going up from Nepal. We were at Camp 3 on our way to Camp 4, where we were going to just rest that night and then continue up to the summit. We got to Camp 3 and around 6, 6.30, we were in the tent eating dinner. And I'm sure you you know the 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 dehydrated beef stew, like the spiral noodles, the cubed yeah, yeah. carrots and the, the green peas and, and the beef chunks. Well, I ate that and then went to sleep, woke up the next morning and I had to vomit. I, I got it all out of my stomach and I could still see the spiral noodles, the beef chunks, the, the orange cubed carrots and the green peas, which meant that my body was shutting down. I was actually suffering cerebral edema, high altitude cerebral edema, which is altitude induced swelling of the brain. And the only way to get rid of it is to go down an altitude. So we were, like I said, on a schedule to go from camp three up to camp four and then go for the summit. Every other person who was on that same schedule, because you have a very short window to actually summit. So everyone, every other group who was on that same schedule, they, they left camp three, moved on to camp four. I slept on oxygen that day, slept on oxygen that night, woke up the day after, felt 100% better. Going back to the groups who left, they went for the summit that night, bad weather came in, they came back down, and they lost their opportunity to climb. So it, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, you know, because if, if I wouldn't have had, let's, let's put it this way, if I wouldn't have had the first, if I wouldn't have had a knee injury, they wouldn't have found the first cancer. If I didn't have the first cancer, they wouldn't have found the second cancer. If I wouldn't have suffered high altitude cerebral edema, I wouldn't have made the summit. So I think I have the world's worst good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I mean, after you managed to find your way up to Mount Everest, and then you managed to find your way down Mount Everest, was there like a, a letdown moment of, like, I've just done one of the most amazing things any human being can ever do. What am I going to do now? Or did you use that? as a stepping stone to continue doing great things. And, and, and how did you get, again, I keep trying to figure this part out. How did you get from doing this kind of stuff to helping people? So there, a while ago, this, this was kind of funny. A while ago, it was either CBS or ESPN compared me to Lance Armstrong. And they said, the only difference is that Lance is retired. So I was, I was continuing on because I wanted to really reach around the world and help other people touched by cancer, giving them hope because we all need to, we all need hope to survive. You know, we all need it every single second of the day. So after I came down Everest, I, I moved, I came back to work to Colorado where I still am. And I started thinking, okay, well, there's this thing called the seven summits, you know, the highest mountain on every continent. I, I had already climbed the big one. The rest will be downhill. Why not do the same thing with the flag that had names of people touched by cancer on the top of each continent? And that's when I really started getting into the speaking. I started visiting hospitals. Um, I started talking to patients. I started talking to the doctors. I started talking to the nurses. I started talking to the pharma companies, just kind of in, injecting them with hope and, and the notion that we are all capable of more. And sometimes... I'm, I'm sure you know that sometimes people need to see something's possible before they believe in their, their own, um, their own potential. You know, they, they need to have that proof. And I know that it's very difficult for patients who are pretty much on their deathbed. I mean, I was, I was read my last rites. I remember laying in a hospital bed, man of the cloth comes in, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, looked at my mom and I said, what, 
What's he doing? I'm still alive. So people who are going through any, any difficult time, any uncertainty for that matter. I mean, there were nights I went to bed, numerous nights I went to bed clo- being terrified to close my eyes because I wasn't sure they were ever going to open again. So I want people to understand and, and I want others to see in themselves what I see in them, which is one reason why I take groups up Kilimanjaro every year as a fundraiser, because I see something in the people that they potentially don't see themselves until they make it, until they see the proof. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I've been up and, up and down the mountain 21 times. Do you know, you said until they see the proof. I would say it's really until they feel the proof, until they have that feeling inside them that they can do anything. It's, it's such an important thing to... To make that, I think, to make that distinction between what we see with our eyes and what we truly see by feeling with our heart. You have that moment, right? And it never goes away. You can never take it away from you. It's there. Yes, you can have bad moments. You can have bad days. But that feeling is something that belongs to you. You experienced it. You can always go back to it. I, I would completely agree with that. You know, because I, I've, I've helped a lot of people with vivid visualization you know, because the mind doesn't know the difference between reality and vivid visualization. And the main component that most people forget to do or they neglect to, to, to associate with that vis- visualization is that aspect of emotion. So when I, when I take people up Kilimanjaro or, or when I work with people as a, a personal coach or a, a private coach or a professional coach, doesn't matter, you're right, tapping into that feeling. How does it make you feel? That's what's going to make it real to you. It's not the thing that's going to make you ha- bring you happiness. You know, it's what that represents to you. So when people say cancer survivors or yourself, if you want to go up Kilimanjaro, it might be something that people want to tick off their, their to-do list or their bucket list, but what does it signify? What does it mean to you and how does it make you feel? So I would completely agree with that. And that moment when you experience another person experiencing their own moment of freedom must be very beautiful for you right? Because you're in some ways facilitating this, right? That's what you're doing. Um, Is that what keeps you going as well? Seeing them reaching their potential? I I would say yes and no, because I was thinking of, again, because I just got back from, from Kilimanjaro, it never fails when people reach the summit. They always come up and they look at me and they say, thank you so much for getting me here. And I instantly turn around. I have a canned response. I didn't get you here. You know, I didn't get it. I didn't do anything to get you here. And then in that instant is when their lives, I, I can see in their face that how much it changes them. They, they have this empowerment now. And they realize, oh my God, he's right. I did this. Mm. So do I enjoy that? Absolutely. And it's, it's usually said through, through tears because we're all so happy and it's an emotional mess when we're up there, but it's an emotional mess for, for a good reason. And I hate to say it, but I love seeing people cry you know, in, a good, in a good way. So seeing that transformation, absolutely, I love it. And I would say you love seeing people cry in a good way. It's also somewhat interesting and cathartic when people cry in a bad way because they are letting out their pain. They are letting out their, their fears. They're letting out their kind of detoxing, right? And it's like my partner, she's like, sometimes she cries, right? It's just humans cry. And she's like, I'm really sorry I'm crying. And I say to her, don't be sorry cry as much as you need to cry. You don't need to apologize to me for your tears. Um, And I think many of us in this society think to ourselves, oh, we shouldn't cry. We shouldn't share. We shouldn't put burdens on others. But if there are people like you who are willing to hold space 
for others, then the others should cry as much as they possibly can, right? Literally cry all the way up to Mount Kilimanjaro and then cry all the way down. Because trust me, if you do that, you will come out of that experience a completely changed human being. Because if we hold it in, it's like poison. Absolutely. And it's kind of funny because I, I don't remember anyone not crying up there. And, and even, even you're right, going up, there are times when people are crying at dinner and I, I ask them, well, what's going on? Like, well, I'm scared. Like, that's fine. You know, people in life get scared all the time. You know, they're scared of dying. They're, they're scared of, of whatever it might be. But then it's, it's also kind of funny when, when people try to cover that up. One was um, a guy, he actually said recently that he learned more about life on that seven day hike up and down the mountain than he did um, 32 years of his life. And he, he served a, a couple of stints in Afghanistan and he's now a police officer. Another guy we took up there, um, he was a, uh, uh, an active Marine, you know, and they're supposed to be tough guys. So he was up there crying, just in tears. We're holding each other and just crying on each other's shoulders. And he covers it up jokingly. And he's in, the, in, in the middle of his tears, he's like, it's such a long way down. Like, <laughs> but giving people that space, helping them understand that it's, it's okay to be human. You know, it, it, crying is fine. I challenge anybody who's gone through what I've been through, given re, being read your last rites, thinking about your parents losing their firstborn to not cry. Mm. You know, you're right. It's cathartic to get it out sometimes. And it feels good. Do uh, you want to cry all the time? I don't. But if you want to and it works for you, by all means, go for it. But whatever works for you, do it. I, I don't think I've ever cried and not felt better after crying. And not had like some kind of mini epiphany after crying. Did you did you watch the notebook? I've read the notebook. <laughs> okay. I didn't watch it. I didn't watch it. Um so you said something about people fearing death. You have faced death. You faced it. You had a priest come to you and give you the last rites. Please tell us what it feels like to face death. Hmm. And not just like, oh, I'm a human being, I'm going to die, right. right? I'm like, you're in a hospital bed, your mum is next to you, a priest is coming giving you the last rites. That is facing death. I remember going through my first treatment, my first, I'm sorry, my first cancer, 13 years old. And my mom and I were standing in the hospital room, looking out into the courtyard. Wintertime, so it was snowing, but somehow there was a rainbow that was going into the courtyard. And two things happened. When I saw that, I looked at her and I said, everything's going to be all right, isn't it? What happened after that too, is that I told her if it was my time as a 13 year old, I'd, I'd lived a good life. Did I want to die? Absolutely not. Was I ready to die? <laughs> no way. But was I okay with it? If, if it was my time, I had to be. So I think when, when you, when you face your own mortality at such a young age, I want to say it was probably easier at 13 than it would be now because now I, I understand what death really means. Like that's it. Lights out. You're gone. You know, the, the great, the great unknown or the great upstairs, whichever you believe. But I think when I was 13, I didn't truly understand the ramifications of cancer. I didn't truly understand what could potentially happen. So I didn't have a grasp on that. When I had the second cancer and they told me I had 14 days to live, I was 16 years old. That's when I had a better grasp on what was going to happen. And in all honesty, I didn't, I wasn't focused on not dying. I was focused on living. And I, I, I 
like I said, I can't tell you how many nights I went to bed not knowing if I was going to wake up the next morning. That, that uncertainty just kind of eats at you. But I became, I became comfortable being uncomfortable because, again, I had no choice. And what, what were my options? Give up and die? So how did it feel? Wow, wow. How, how much time do you have? <laughs> And we could we could we could get really deep in this because it, it, I think it changes as you get older because you have different priorities you have different values and when I was younger all honestly all I wanted to do was just be normal again you know I was I was sick and tired of being sixty or seventy pounds overweight I was sick and tired of uh, being talked about behind my back you know I, I felt like a troll there were numerous times I looked in the mirror I did, I couldn't even recognize myself. You know, I, was, I was vomiting for 36 hours nonstop sometimes. But now being older, I look back at that and I think to myself, what did my parents go through? It was probably more difficult on them. But look, looking at, at, at death from a, another standpoint where I actually voluntarily put myself in harm's way, because like I said, with the cancer, I didn't have a choice. But climbing the seven summits, I did. And I was on Denali, which is the highest mountain in North America. And I, I literally fell 100 feet. I had 50 feet of rope between my climbing partner and I. So I fell 50 feet to him and then 50 feet down. And it's, it's amazing how, how quickly the brain works. And I remember I was just rocketing down the mountain on my back thinking, well, this isn't good. <laughs> I should probably try to stop. Rolled over with my ice axe, dug it in the snow, and I, I finally came to a stop. But the feeling that I had when I knew I was rocketing down to p- potentially to my death, I had this, this overwhelming s- sensation and, and feeling of calmness. It was really weird, which also reminded me that I, when I was going through my second cancer, I do remember, and this is going to sound really out there, I do remember because I had a temperature of 107 or 108 degrees. So I remember I was looking down at my own body in bed. And again, I was, I was completely calm. I, I wasn't worried about dying or anything, but I just thought it was weird that I was looking at my body laying in, in my own bed at home. And it was, it was very bright around me. And all of a sudden, I just felt something on my back, almost like a hand pushing me back. And I just went, <gasps> and I woke up in bed. <clears throat> so I've, I've never been afraid of death. But it's something I'm not looking forward to. (laughs) How would you help someone? And I'm sure you probably had to do this, right? How would you help someone who is facing, who is facing death? Just like, just like anything in life. That's a great question too. Focus on what you have control over. You know, if, if someone is going to die, continue giving them hope until their last breath. You know, everywhere I go, I, I, I visit local hospitals and I, I talk to the cancer patients, as I mentioned. And one, I, was, I visited the Sydney Children's Hospital when I climbed the highest mountain in Australia. And I was in touch with a young man, wow, probably twice a week via email. And we were just going back and forth, chatting, talking about adventures and what he was going to do when he, got, when he was placed in remission. And then all of a sudden, there was just this, this long silence, nothing. No emails came back. And I got an email from his mom letting me know that he passed away. And, you know, that hit me hard. But in that email, she said to not be sad because every day he continued talking about how he wanted to be like me. And then I gave him hope every day. So I think anybody who's on their deathbed, continue, ha- continue having that hope and don't go to bed with any anger. Don't go to bed with looking at what you weren't able to accomplish, what you couldn't do. Go to bed with an attitude of gratitude and look at everything you were able to accomplish, everything you could do and everything you did do. I got chills. When you shared that story, um, 
And I will say that that gentleman was very lucky to have you in his life. And you were very lucky to have him. And what you just shared about how you help people who are facing death is basically exactly what you can teach people who are not necessarily facing death, right? Of course, we are all facing death, but for many of us, it's not right there in front of us. Um, have you ever heard the movie, and uh, not the movie, the song, um, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Always look on the bright side of <laughs> life. <laughs> I mean, to me, again, I've known you for 35 minutes, right? But to me, that song could be your, I don't want to, could be your, um, your life mantra, right? doesn't mean that you, you don't see things realistically as they are, but it means that you always look on the bright side of life, right? Yeah, because when you do that, yeah. when you do that, and I'm not saying I do because I don't, unfortunately, I wish I did. Um, but when you do that, you can turn anything into a success, right? Um, and that's possibly one of the most important lessons that any of us can learn. Well, and, and it all depends on perspective. It all depends because every morning we wake up, we have a choice in how we want to deal with our situation. We have a choice in how we deal with, with COVID. We have a choice in, in how we deal with our significant other. We have a choice in how we deal with, with our business partners. We have a choice in how we want. It's all based on how we choose to react. And the, and the funny thing is, that's one of the greatest freedoms of life is, is the freedom of choice. Because no matter what happens to us, we can choose however we want to react. You know, I, I could have gone through these two cancers and, and been done with it. I could have been a, an evil, evil, bitter person thinking, my God, life hates me. God's awful. But I didn't. I saw it as a, a second or third chance at life. Why wouldn't I embrace it? Why wouldn't everyone embrace it? Every time your eyes open up, you tell yourself, today is the best day ever. Why is that? Because it might be your last. Mm. And you're right. We're all approaching or we're all, we're all facing death. But for 99% oh, of the population, it's not real. You know, it's, it's in, and if something's not in their face, if something's not tangible to them, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to deal with it, so they ignore it. And then what happens? It gets worse and worse, and it festers. It's just like a cancer. If you don't get treated for the cancer, it's going to grow and grow and grow, and you're going to die. You know, when I when I also speak in uh, in conferences, etc., and I tell people to share their pain, and I tell them, if you don't share your pain, it will consume you. If you don't share your pain. Ultimately, it will destroy you. And that's pretty much exactly what you just said. But what if people don't have someone to share it with? They have people like you. And they have people like me. Who, if they truly, truly want to get their pain out of their system, they can go on the internet and they can find people like you and people like me and they can share the fact that they don't have anyone to share their pain and they can find just one person because all you need is one person. You don't need 10, 15, 20 people that you can share your pain with. And I understand there are people out there that don't have that one person. Yeah. Um, and for anyone who's listening today, I would like to tell them that if they don't have that one person, they can reach out to me. And I'm sure, guaranteed, that they can also reach out to you. Right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's a great question because I know what it feels like to not be able to share my pain. 
and I know what it feels like to be able to share my pain. And they're two totally different worlds. And I hope that anyone listening today, if they're living in that world when they have no one to share their pain, they just find that one human being that they can share. And for whatever reason, if they don't have a human being, all you really need is a piece of paper and a pen, right? Because you can share everything that's going on inside you on that piece of paper. And I guarantee that you will feel better. Guaranteed. Absolutely. This, you, you, should, you should rename this from, uh, to um, spontaneous moments of deep conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, look, I, it's interesting, man. I, I'm, actually, I'm actually an introvert, and I'm quite happy with my own company and the company of my dog uh, and my partner. Sorry, she's in the other room. She'll be like, how dare you say that? Um, but when I converse on a deep level with someone, stranger, family member, friend, it changes the way I perceive the world. It makes me grounded. It, it, it kind of gives me hope. And it is a, it's a beautiful thing. And the whole reason for this podcast and the whole reason for the name of the podcast is that 41 minutes ago, I had no idea who you were, right? And now... After 41 minutes of heart-centered conversation, we could go on for another 41 hours. I can imagine walking up Mount Kilimanjaro with you, right? Because we've had a conversation from here, from our hearts, from our place of, of a place of love, a place of our humanity. And that in itself is, is priceless. It is priceless. And when you've had those experiences, which you have every time you walk up the mountain, every time you walk into a hospital, and many other times, I'm sure, you know that it is a life-affirming practice to connect with another human being. And I don't need to know you, and you don't need to know me in order for us to have a deep conversation that reminds us that we both share a common humanity. Absolutely. And it's, it's also, it's very similar to, uh, to traveling where you have single serving friends, where you actually have a conversation with someone on the plane. If, if they have a conversation, a lot of times, you know, they put their headphones on there, whatever, and they're, they're out or you ask them a question, Hey, how you doing? And they answer, I'm okay. Or, well, what do you do? Nothing. You know, those, those are the people who are in their own world and that's, that's fine. That's the way they want to be. I'm the guy on the plane. Hey, how you doing? And I really mean it. Like, hey, what's going on in your life? Mm-hmm. And I, I wish I wish more people. Well, let me rephrase that. It boggles my mind knowing how it boggles my mind looking at how many people are more concerned about what others think of them than what they think of themselves. So a lot of people wouldn't have these conversations because they would be afraid that they're, they're constantly being judged. As opposed to it, it connecting on a deeper level with, with another human being. And I, I wish more people did that. Because a lot of times when they get together, they, and it's probably because you know, 90% of the world wakes up and they turn on the news. And before they go to bed, they turn on the news and they're programming their brain with negative thoughts. And they think the world's out to get them. But this is proof positive that there are two strangers who can come together and have a great, meaningful, deep conversation about some fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And hopefully some people will be inspired and hopefully their hearts will open a little bit more. And, you know, the truth is that you and I, I sense a commonality between us and really that is simply that you are connected to your humanity. I am currently connected to my humanity, right? And we're meeting in that common space of our shared humanity. Um, And more people need to do that. And all you need to do is turn on the news 
to see that a lot of people, most people, are not doing that. And uh, that's not going to end well, right? It's just not going to end well. So listen, man, I literally could sit here and talk to you for hours, um, but we don't have hours. Um, <laughs> what I would love to do uh, is if you could send me some of your the stuff that you do in the climbing of Mount Kilimanjaro, because I would love one day to do that. It's always been a dream to to climb, uh, you know, Kilimanjaro. It's been a dream to to climb Everest, but I don't. I just it's not a dream that I want to actually make happen. <laughs> Kilimanjaro is a dream that I want to make happen. So please, please send me some of your stuff, and I'd love to to stay in touch. Um, and hopefully, you know, some some people will reach out to you after listening to this. Um, and it, it's it's just it's just a, it's a beautiful thing just to to connect, just to connect one heart to another. And it's interesting. And I'll say this before we leave: the opening parts of this conversation were a little bit awkward, right? I don't know you; you don't know me. We're kind of flailing a little bit. But this part of the conversation, the last. 40 minutes of the conversation have just been magnificent. It's a, it's a, it's just a really beautiful thing to be able to connect two human beings. So I want to thank you for coming on and for being willing to, to speak from the heart. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and I agree. I was, I was told kind of what you did and how the, the conversation was going to go. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll throw a, throw a little loop in there. Instead of just talking about myself, I'll have him ask questions, you know, play 20 questions, be, be a little bit different. I, just, I probably my... did ask the 20 questions, right? Maybe I'm on question yeah. 18. <laughs> I'll ask you the 20th question at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. There you go. And I will hold you to that. And, right. and, and, and to answer your initial question, who am I? I'm actually the only person in history to climb Mount Everest, the highest mountain on every continent, ski to both the North and South Poles and complete the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon. And I did it all after those two terminal cancers, 14 days to live, a medically induced coma for a year of my life. And I only have one functioning lung, but the only difference between me and you is that I have a warmer jacket. <laughs> and I would say the only difference between me and you is that you're a legend and I'm not yet. Keep going. Seriously. Keep, I, keep I, going. I, I appreciate that, but it all depends on whose eyes. There you go. Because my mom loves me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right, man. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. It's Leon here, a.k.a. The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have a new video out in the world.